As coronavirus spreads around the world, one thing becomes increasingly important, testing. Testing is a fundamental part of any government's attempt to limit the spread of the virus. And there's a whole variety of reasons why testing is important. You need to know whether a patient's infected or not, and if they're safe to return to society. You need to know whether your health workers have had the virus, and if they're safe to return to work. You need to know the total rate of infection to know how effective your policies have been. Having tests and testing your citizens is therefore incredibly important. The problem is that tests aren't easy to come by. So in this video, we're going to explain the different types of tests available, how they actually work and how accurate they are. So there are two main types of tests that we're going to discuss in this video. The slow but accurate genetic tests and the quicker but less reliable antibody tests. Both have different approaches and benefits, but let's start with the genetic tests. Even within the category of genetic testing, there are a number of different tests available, but they have one thing in common. They look at the genetic material found within a sample. However, what they sample depends on the tests in question. There are three common samples. The first is a swab of the throat or nose, taken using a long swab that looks a bit like a cotton bud. The second is a blood sample. And the third kind of test takes samples of sputum. And while coughing up sputum might not sound like a pleasant experience, research out of China suggests that these tests have been some of the most successful. Once these samples have been taken, either at home, in a hospital, or in some countries in a drive through testing facility, they're taken to a lab to be examined. The technician who examines the sample will extract its nucleic acid, where the virus's genome is held. They can then examine the sample to see how well it matches the genetic sequences that are commonly found within the coronavirus. At this point, we know a good amount about the virus's makeup. We were able to sequence the virus's genome pretty quickly, and we understand a lot about the anatomy of the virus. Most importantly, about the RNA enclosed in the centre. Using this knowledge, scientists are able to hone in on the genetic material that really matters. And that's important because SARS-CoV-2 contains approaching 30,000 nucleotides. Of these 30,000, the test focuses on 100 that contain two key genes found within the virus. If both of these genes are found in the sample, then it's considered positive. However, if not, then the result will be negative. So the process for genetic testing goes as follows. A sample is taken, the sample is examined, and it's determined if the sample contains the same genetic material found within the virus. Before we get into any more science, there are three caveats worth keeping in mind that relate to the accuracy, timing, and speed of these genetic tests. Firstly, it's worth acknowledging that these tests aren't 100% accurate. While they're normally incredibly accurate, there's a whole raft of reasons why these tests can end up giving faulty results. These cover a whole spectrum, from technical issues to the way that the sample is transported, or even human error. Because of this, there are a number of examples of both false positives and false negatives coming out of Chinese testing. So while these tests are useful, they can't always be fully relied upon. And that's not a controversial thing for us to be saying. The World Health Organization has said the exact same thing, saying that one or more negative tests do not rule out the possibility of COVID-19 virus infection. So these tests are vital, but like most things in life, they're not completely infallible. Secondly, the timing of the tests is super important. That's because these tests can only spot the genetic sequences they require if the patient currently has the virus. Once the patient recovers from the virus and the virus has passed, the genetic sequences simply aren't there to spot anymore. So these tests can only tell you if you currently have the virus, not if you've already had it in the past. Though there are other tests that do that, and we'll discuss some of those later. Also, if you've only recently caught the virus, the tests might give a false negative, as the virus hasn't started shedding into the throat, and as such, it won't be detectable in throat or mouth swabs. Essentially, with these tests, timing is important, and if you don't fall into the right window, the results won't always be accurate. Finally, we need to keep in mind the speed. Testing is definitely getting faster, but it's not an instant result. As I said, the samples have to be examined, and this can take time. There are some labs who can provide the results within hours, but on the whole, the process takes longer than that, especially considering how busy labs are at the moment. 
Bosch claims to be on the leading edge of this faster new technology though. They've developed a new testing system, which in their words, cuts the process down from 24 hours to two and a half hours. Bosch's system starts in the same way as the conventional method. Doctors take a swab from a patient and place that swab into a cartridge. In turn, this is placed into a freestanding console, which tests the swab. A Bosch product manager commented on this new system, explaining that it's all automatic. Stick in the swab and seal it, and it saves the interminable transportation routes. He went on to say that as a result, the system is very simple. With minimal manual work, the doctor gets the result direct, day or night, negative or positive, and can react directly and quickly. Now we don't want this video to turn into a Bosch sales pitch, but new tech like this, if effective and rolled out efficiently, could make the process of testing far easier. These faster results allow people to take quicker, more informed action, and the automated process frees up scientists and technicians to focus on other tasks. The problem is that despite being faster, and hopefully limiting the number of errors in the process, these technological solutions still aren't perfect, and they still can't tell if you've had the virus in the past. Enter the antibody test. Unlike the genetic testing we've discussed so far, antibody tests can tell if a patient has had the virus in the past, and maybe if they still have it. You might wonder why this matters. If you no longer have the virus, then why do you still need testing? Well, if you've recovered from the coronavirus, it can be assumed that you have some immunity from the virus, at least for some time. Therefore, knowing if people have had the virus can tell you if they're safe to go back to work or look after more vulnerable people. This is especially important for healthcare workers, who are not only at a heightened risk of catching the virus, but also at an increased risk of passing it on. So, how do the antibody tests work? Well, as you might remember from science class, shout out to Mr. Berry, the human body produces antibodies to neutralize pathogens such as the coronavirus. This is the immune system's response to try and fight the disease, and it's this antibody response that these tests are picking up on. These tests don't require a swab, a throat sample, or any sputum, which is good because even the word sputum is disgusting. Instead, they rely on a blood sample. These tests also don't require scientists or any expensive lab equipment. The patient simply collects a blood sample, places it in the well in the test, adds a couple of drops of buffer fluid, and then after waiting 15 minutes, the result is shown in a similar way to a pregnancy test. Instead of trying to hunt down the virus itself, these antibody tests are trying to identify the body's response to the virus, the antibodies. If the virus can detect the antibodies in the patient's blood, then the result will show that the person either has or has had the virus. This discrepancy is because the body continues to produce antibodies for some time, even after the virus has been detected. So even if the body has killed the coronavirus, the antibodies can still be detected by the test, thus solving the problem we discussed earlier. However, by solving this problem, the test kind of creates another, another two in fact. Firstly, because the test is only looking for antibodies and not the virus itself, it won't pick up the infection until the antibodies are being produced. That means that in the first couple of weeks of infection, the test will show negative results, as the antibodies fight back may not have begun yet, and therefore can't yet find any antibodies. Some tests can tell the difference between those who are infected and those who have defeated the virus already, but none can detect the virus in the initial period when the patient is most infectious. The way that the test can tell the difference between infected people and those who have recovered is super interesting. So indulge me for a moment longer as I explain how it works. As I said, there's normally a delay between the time of infection and the production of antibodies, normally around two weeks. When the body does begin producing these antibodies, they are IgM antibodies. A couple days later, the body will begin producing IgG antibodies. Over time, the body reduces the number of IgM antibodies being produced and increases the number of IgG, and people tend to recover as the IgG antibody count gets higher. Besides showing off my A-star science GCSE, why does any of this matter? Well, remember the testing kit I mentioned earlier, the one that looks like a pregnancy test? Well, some of these tests can differentiate between the two types of antibodies. As well as the control line, these tests have two other indicators, 
the G line and the M line. As some of you might have already guessed, these lines represent the presence of IgG and IgM antibodies respectively. By knowing the type of antibodies the patient has in their system, you can tell how far the process they are. If the IgM levels are still high, the patient likely still has the virus. Whereas if the IgM has dropped down and the IgG is far higher, they've probably recovered from the virus. Cool, right? Or just me? Anyway, the bigger issue with these tests is their reliability. In fact, despite purchasing 3.5 million antibody tests, the UK government insisted on holding them back while they checked their effectiveness. There are lots of companies producing antibody tests like the ones we've discussed, and thus they haven't all been fully and independently verified. Also, on the whole, these kinds of tests do tend to be less accurate than a genetic test. So, even once they've received the independent sign-off, they're unlikely to be as reliable as the genetic testing we discussed earlier in the video. But they do have their advantages. As I explained, they can detect even those who have recovered, as well as being very quick and cheap. Rapid antibody tests can work within 10 minutes, and with the British company SureScreen selling them for only £6, it's easy to see their appeal. That's why Britain bought 3.5 million of these tests, because they're a cheap, easy, and reasonably efficient way of telling if someone's had the virus, and therefore if they can return to society. But it's not just Britain. Countries around the world have been investing in tests like this, with Professor Sharon Peacock from Public Health England commenting that tests like this are being ordered all across Europe and elsewhere, and purchased in Southeast Asia. This is a widespread practice. We're not alone in doing this. So that's how coronavirus testing works at the moment, both genetic and antibody testing. If you have any further questions about the testing procedures across the globe, please drop us a comment below. We'd also love to hear how you think your country is doing when it comes to testing. Are they doing enough? And what should they be doing? Remember, you can also get involved in the conversation over on Discord and join the approaching 2,000 active TLDR members on the server. Finally, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a video.